Women's Organization. We have brought this event to you today because we would like to bring awareness to domestic violence as well as to educate and uplift our community so that we can break the cycle of abuse. We will hear from several different, um, several guest speakers and performers this evening. Our featured speaker guest is Vivian Gale Bennett. Vivian is a counselor and addiction music therapist with 17 years clean and sober over 12 years of experience working within drug and alcohol addiction treatment, providing addiction and mental health treatment, and utilizing individual group and therapy. To learn more about her, you can visit her website at www.vivianedale.com. Our special guest performer is Faithful Watkins, Faithful Naomi. Naomi is currently the spiritual daughter of Apostle Helen and Bishop George Sadler at the Into Chamber Ministries International in Kent. And during the years of 2004 to 2006, she ministered through song on several different occasions at the Faithful for Living Covenant Church International. You can learn more about Faithful Walking at faithfulwalking.faithful.com. And she also is bringing a guest um, with her as well. His name is Trevor Spencer. Special guest speakers will be Eric George. He will be sharing a domestic violence perspective from an abuser or she say from one who was once an abuser, and he will also share his struggle with um, overcoming that lifestyle and assisting to end the cycle of abuse. We will also have a special presentation done by Haley Langston. It will be a poem done by myself from one of my books. And you can learn more about Haley at her website, www.equalexpressions.com. We'd like to thank the sponsors who have helped make this event. And that would be Zola's Cafe, Korea Empowerment Artist Media, Youthful Expressions, National Poetry Awards, Women's Poet International, Silent Minds Entertainment Group, Pride Hunting Foundation, and the Homeless Not Hopeless Poet for Change and Virtual Family. We're going to start off also by sharing that we're going to do a raffle this evening. We're going to have two items raffled. The first is going to be three $5 um, coffee cards, and then we're also raffling three um, massage sessions. They're a $50 value each. And the raffle tickets are a dollar piece. And you can get them from Haley at the door. We're going to do our first raffle at 5, at, um, 5 p.m. And then at 6, and then at 6.45. Our first guest that we're going to bring up is Vivian Gale, who also is the author of a book entitled Bart in the Wind. It is a book that helps you understand how emotions affect your health, your body, mind, voice, and emotions, what type of party you are, tried and tested ways of arguing with grace, how your values affect your relationships, and get rid of stinking thinking and random brain parts, and how to heal yourself and your life. So I'd like to bring you to the mic, Vivian Gale. I'm going to get started. I, 
Also singing, playing the guitar, and my poetry, so I'm going to share some of that with you while I'm talking. Um, we are talking about domestic violence, so I'll try and be um, sensitive because there are children here. <laughs> I'm going to start out by talking about uh, myself a little bit in my life. Um, I was a child of seven children and grew up in the country and my parents, a lot of my brothers and sisters had um, <clears throat> sickle cell and I was the middle child. Not really, but technically I was because there was four girls, a son, and then me born 14 months later. <laughs> so I didn't get much attention because the only son who came before me. And two of those before we had sickle cell anemia, so they were constantly in the hospital, and et cetera. So, anyways, my parents had a big challenge of raising five kids by themselves. And that's never easy. Unfortunately, they raised us with an old school model, which was you got to spank me for pretty much everything you did. <laughs> and back in the day, there wasn't really a caption or any type of um, stop, you know, signal that they had. They would just spank you until they got tired, you know, spanking you. You didn't go outside, you could switch, or you get a spanking. I remember one time I got a spanking with a, uh, a radio antenna. <laughs> and that was very painful. So basically, back in the day, if you just looked at your parents the wrong way, you would get slapped. Back up in church, you got knocked dead. Not only by your parents, but by any person <laughs> that was your elder up in church. And you know, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So anyways, um, I used a little humor in my book to talk about some of the things that happened to me. So when I was 11 and a half, um, my parents got divorced and um, my mother moved out here, out west, to um, start her life all over again. And she decided not to take me with her, so she sent me to my father's house for the weekend. And then my sister called me and said, hey, you better come, mom's leaving and she's not taking you. So, Actually, it wasn't my sister told my best friend that lives next door, so he got on his bike and he rode his bike all the way <laughs> to my father's house to get me. And I took the bike and rode all the way back to hurry up and get there. And when I got there, she was driving away with my other brothers and sisters in the car. And that was my first original trauma. I was severed from my whole family in that moment. <clears throat> I think they found me on a rock, you know, <laughs> unconscious. And right beside the rock, there was this big garbage or dumpster. And that's next to where we used to live. And so all my life, I felt like nothing. I felt like garbage. <laughs> my own mother left me. And so that um, was my first original trauma, like I said. So I'm going to sing a song for you called I'm a Survivor, which is my mantra. <laughs> and, and it stems from some of the things I'm talking about and we'll continue to talk about. I'm a survivor, yeah. I'm a survivor, yeah. I'm a survivor, yeah. Come on and watch me. Come on and watch me. Come on and watch me. Come on and watch me survive.
You can make me shaky, break it or you can break me. So you can lie on me, you can spy on me, you can walk away or run from me. You can beat me or you can cheat me. If you want, you can even try to keep me alive. Give it your best try, you can't defeat me. I'm a survivor. to hide her anguish. She's drowning, no one to save her. 
so she can swim, only wade in the tide. She's standing, but her legs are crumbling from the mirror outward, so she sinks. She sinks in the sand. So she dies by never living. So she dies by never trusting. So then she dies by never fully embracing love and life, and never fully believing and feeling the real sad of love. Little girls cry. That's why. Little girls cry. They die. That's the reason. The treason. So I wrote that poem when a friend of mine in my space uh, asked me to write something for her to put on her page. She has a page that um, so it's a very supportive for uh, children and people and women who have been through abusive situations. Okay, so um, when I was a child, if, if I'm talking about something that happened to me, I'm not talking about the people who did it, I'm talking about what happened to me. So in my, in my family, you know, there was a lot of emotional abuse and stuff like that. But I'm an overcomer, you know, and that's the greatest part of any story is that you can live to, to come out on the other side. And everybody has a story, nobody's life is easy and nobody's life is perfect. You know, and a lot of times we don't even talk about the things that happen to us in our life because we're ashamed. You know, and because I was one of the people who told, even before my mother abandoned me, I ran away from home a lot because she would beat me and I would run away and because I was tired of the spankings, I was tired of the emotional abuse, I was just so sick and tired of all the things that were happening in my family. And one of the things that is a very popular statement that you hear in broken families is don't talk about what happens in this house, don't trust anybody, and don't and don't feel, don't talk about your emotions. And so that was, those were the three things that I was always afraid of, you know, that if I told, you know, about what was going to happen, to, what was happening to me, that I would be homeless without a place to live. But I couldn't take it anymore, and I ended up uh, telling, and that's exactly what happened. I ended up without a place to live. So after my mother abandoned me, I stayed with my father. And I guess, I don't know how I got there to this day. I was catatonic for two weeks. I didn't go to school, I didn't talk, I didn't eat anything. <laughs> so all I remember was my father one day, I was coming out of it, <clears throat> and the phone was on my ear, and it was my mother's voice. By that time, she had moved from Connecticut all the way to Washington, and she was saying, Vivian, Vivian, are you there? I asked you if you wanted to come. And I just got so mad. I just went back into my, you know, catatonic state, <laughs> wherever I was. But I started to feel the anger. I started to feel everything that I was uh, escaping from by anesthetizing all the things that happened to me. I always say that I've been through too much, more than what one person can bear. But I think that before we come here, we make an agreement with God that God, the Bible says that God knew us before we were born. And so I believe that somehow we knew what our trials and our tribulations were going to be. And we said, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. But I can tell you something, I was crazy. Whoever, you know, that person was a there that says, okay, I'll do it, I'll suffer these things. You know, and so I don't have any resentment towards my parents today, but it took a long time. It took a long time for me to forgive my ancestor, and it was my father, so I could have waited for him to say he was sorry. And he never said he was sorry, and so when we would have family gatherings and stuff like that, everybody else would gather around him because they would pretend that nothing happened. You know, and so they would just tell me to get over it, or it was like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, get over it. And I just kept waiting for him to say he was sorry, and he never said he was sorry, and so that kept me. <laughs> angry for so many years, and then finally I realized one day that I was going to have to let go anyway, even if he never said he was sorry. And so I began working on that, I began working on forgiveness for myself, and I began on working on emotional healing. So this is the first one in my book, it's really a metaphor for emotional flatulence and the stuff that we hold on to. And in studying about um, feelings and emotions, I learned that they actually make you sick, you know. And so because I internalized so much of my feelings all my life, I became Ill, I diagnosed with lupus. I mean, in this book I talk about it. After a while, this got so long, I got embarrassed to even tell you <laughs> anybody. But on the upside, um, it made me learn how to, um, you know, seek healing in a holistic perspective. And so, in this beginning of this book, I do talk about emotional reflection. As I talked about the body and how the emotions affect your health, and you know, ways that you can, uh, when you get better emotionally, then you get better. 
Mm -hmm. So that's what I believe. So as I've been getting better and healing myself emotionally, I've also been getting better um, physically. So a little bit about um, domestic violence is that um, a lot of times we don't understand the reason why people do the things that they do. And then as I got older, I found out that my mother was a victim of uh, sexual abuse. I never found out about my father and why he was the way he was, but I had to come to a place where I understand, where I understood that we become what we hate, you know, and if we don't seek the help that we need, then we're gonna continue uh, the cycle in our own families, and so that's when I ended up becoming a counselor, um, kind of, sort of, I skipped some stuff, but I ended up becoming a counselor, and that helped me to work on my own issues, but it was very difficult. So a person that usually um, is violence uh, domestically is suffering from their own inner emotions and from their own uh, unresolved issues that they've never you know, taken care of. And so when they go into treatment, as a counselor, I had an opportunity to work with uh, some people <laughs> that were abusers and I couldn't do it. It was very difficult for me. I wanted to do it. I wanted to sit in a courtroom um, with a person who had actually abused people, but at that time I still hadn't addressed all of the issues that I had with it myself. So, you know, I chose not to do it. But just the idea, you know, that that was going on, I didn't even know that there were programs for them. You know, I didn't know, you know. And in a way, I was glad that they were there and they were in it however they got there, but at the same way, I just wanted to take a gun and go shoot them all. You know, <laughs> it was kind of like when I got clean and sober, and a friend of mine, her husband was in um, al -Anon. Well, she went to al I'm sorry, for her husband, who would go to a and so when I went to a, I went to an Al Anon meeting when before I was waiting to go to treatment for like 30 days clean and sober, I went into an Al Anon meeting and when I heard the stories and how hurt they were by the addict and alcoholic's behavior, I didn't dare open my mouth. <laughs> I thought I would be stoned to death, you know, that I was actually one of those people that caused you some of your pain. You know, but like I said, over the years, like when you're in that moment and you're still dealing with it, you have so many raw emotions. You know, and I just thank God, you know, that I continue to, you know, to pour my heart out to God, to cry and to strive and to find every measure I could to get better that, you know, I did. And it did, it wasn't easy. And I lost my family all over again. I moved here um, 11 years ago to get my, have my children know the side of my family. And I had a few good years with them, but it started all over again. They didn't know how to support me. When I was having a difficult time, um, actually I got raped and, uh, by a deacon in one of the churches that I was attending. And then my brother literally said, oh boy, don't start this story all over again. What does every guy you see want to rape you? You know, and I don't think that's true. I, I do think that when we have issues that we haven't fully dealt with, that they'll keep coming back into our life until we address them. So that's my story and I'm speaking to you. <laughs> um, coercion. And my mother and my father would do that. Like my mother, she would, she locked me in the room uh, one whole summer. And how I got out was I, I got to climb out the window. There wasn't any electricity, we didn't have electricity. So she took all my brothers and sisters out to dinner and she locked me in my bedroom. So she told me not to come out. Well, I was used to that. I think that's why I used to read so much <laughs> and write so much because I was always isolated. And that's one of the things that they do, abusers, they isolate you. For some reason, they've targeted you for their hatred or targeted you as a scapegoat for your pain. And I was that person, and a lot of people in my family say it's because I looked the most like her. So, anyways, I jumped out the window that day, and when I was in that room, I promised myself that if my mother ever hit me again, that I was gonna hit her back. And like I said, I've been in the hospital for, you know, from her hitting me before, and nobody ever believed me because I was a kid. You know, so when we went to court, you know, I remember the judge asked me, uh, you know, I bought a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and sent me back home. And but before we went to court, my mother threatened me that if I said anything about her negative, that when I got home, it was going to be a lot worse. And so I knew from history that I was going to end up going back home. <laughs> so I was afraid to tell the truth about the things that were happening um, through her. One time she beat me with a metal, a metal ruler. Um, I used to carry it. It was my own metal ruler. And uh, he broke a couple of my fingers. And so. I ran to our pastor's house and um, I told him, you know, I started emptying myself of some of the things that were happening. He, his wife and my mother were best friends, so he didn't leave me either. 
So I got sent back. I kept getting sent back into the abusive situation. By this time, my father was gone. So that final time I hit my mother, I ran. All my brothers and sisters chased me, and they started beating me up too because I hit my mother. I was just sick and tired of it, and so, you know, they chased me down the main street. I wrote a song about that one too. <laughs> it's called, Sometimes You Just Gotta Walk Through Life With One Shoe. And it's because when I was running, I lost one shoe, and they were still chasing me. <laughs> and so I didn't stop to get my shoe. I just kept on running, you know. And so um, I can laugh about that today, but when I got to my destination, you know, I never went back um, to my mother's house from there. And so it took me two and a half years to get to live with my father. By then I was 15. When I got to live with my father, I didn't remember um, the sexual abuse from the past. I was too young, so I stuck it. All I remember was hiding in the closets, running from him anytime we were alone, um, you know, locking myself, always making sure I was safe away from him. I remember one Sunday everybody went to church and I was sick, and, and my mom was like, who wants to stay home with Vivian? And my dad said, I will. <laughs> he was all too happy, and I was like, oh my God. And so that whole day, I couldn't even rest. You know, I was hiding across the street. There was a farm with, with uh, weeds and cows. I was there all day, sick, laying in the, um, in the uh, bushes. But before I got out the house, I heard him walking around. Hey, where are you? Where are you? And I was just like, oh, please help me get out of here, you know. And so I was able to get out of here, and I escaped that event. But when I was in treatment for drugs and alcohol, I went through a series of broken relationships in my life. Um, anybody that told me they loved me, I clung to them like glue, and they were all abusive for some reason. I, I guess I was an abuse attractor, a magnet. I attracted what I was. You know, you, you attract people who are on the same level as you are. And so people who are, have been abused, women or men, will gravitate towards people who abuse until they learn how to break the cycle. I used to work for a program, I think in Tacoma, and they had a cycle, I mean a program called Break the Cycle. And so that stuck in my head as that's always something that's possible that we can do. We can break the cycle so that we don't repeat the same thing to our children. And I remember one day when I was put in that situation where I was almost about to become the abuser. And I prayed and I cried, I stayed up all night. I just would not allow myself to cross that line. And I thank God that I was able to overcome that. And I had to do it more than once. And then I started going to counseling for, uh, for sexual abuse. And then I heard a lot of stories that I never could imagine. Like women like me who had abused their sons and were living with that guilt. And I just thank God that I never had crossed that bridge, you know. So, um, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, I'm a recover. Getting better is a lot of work. Don't let anybody fool you. You know, and if you're holding on to uh, any type of sexual abuse, any type of emotional abuse that you haven't discussed or talked to anybody about, you're only as sick as your secrets. That's something they say in any day. And I'm telling that to be true. So, um, how much time do I have left? Okay, so you're only as sick as your secrets. And as a counselor, I became a counselor um, when I got clean and sober, I had one year, and I decided to go back to school. Actually, God chose that career for me. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to go uh, be like Oprah, <laughs> you know, be on the news and be best friends with Gail King, and you know, have a good voice for speaking. And I didn't end up doing it. And it's like the, I went to an AA convention that weekend, and that weekend the Holy Spirit was really messing with me because I said to God, you know, and I talked to God just like I'm talking to you. And I said, God, you know, I'm willing to do your will in my life to show me what it is. And I said that before I went to the NA, NA convention. And when I went, um, it was given to me to write addiction and recovery music. And so that's what I started doing. And I'm still working on my first CD. And it's called Celebrate Life. So anyway, you can get my business cards and you can listen to some of my sample songs on MySpace. I have another song that I was uh, share with you. It's called um, Freedom. And freedom is a name that I took for myself as a proclamation of my freedom. Uh, if you look on my website, um, it's geared toward personal freedom. That's what I stand for. And so what I hope to be able to do with individuals and families and with organization wherever I'm led and allowed to serve is to help people um, become free. Uh, personal freedom, which I define as emotional freedom, spiritual freedom, physical freedom, 
and uh, something else that you'll hear in my song. There's five aspects of it. And I mean, some people that you know, if you ask them about me, like my brother, you know, <laughs> he's a minister and a pastor, I don't know. I just assume, you know, that they'll probably think that I'm still, you know, uh, messed up in the head, you know, from all the stuff that happened to me. And, but you know, the funny thing about it is the same people that make you crazy are the ones that will point and say, hey, look, she's crazy, stay away from her. <laughs> You know, and so yeah, I've been through some bouts with insanity or on the edge of it and not quite knowing if I was there yet. But if you have to ask, right? <laughs> Am I insane? Is this the moment? Have I finally lost my mind? Well then, you know, I guess you have to, you know, remember that. And so I have my children. I have five children out of my life. Five children that I raised by myself, who I'm all very proud of, you know, and they all three of them went to college, the other two are still uh, 20 and 18, and uh, they're doing really well, and they're my biggest supporters, and I know when I look at them that I was here for a reason. So I had went through this thing with them too, where I wanted to exert power and control over them, because that's all I knew. I was only parenting the way I knew how to parent, and one day I saw myself standing with my daughter with my hand up about to punch her, and she was caught like in a corner, you know, and all of a sudden I had a physical, like a vision, where I became my mother and she became me. It was so freaky, weird. It's just like it actually happened, and I stopped, you know, and I didn't hit her. And, uh, <laughs> you know, from that day on, I made it my mission to, um, you know, get better. And so what happened, I was still, I was already working as a counselor, and they needed somebody to teach a parenting class. And so I volunteered to teach the parenting class so that I can have the materials. <laughs> You know, to learn from, and that really helped me a lot. I didn't want to raise my hand and say, "Hey, you know, I'm a counselor and I need help with my kids. You know, help me." You know, I was embarrassed. You know, but believe me, there's a lot of counselors out there that still need good counseling. And as a matter of fact, when I was in college, one counseling, uh, our teacher, our professor suggested that we all go, so we know what it's like to be on the other side. And I was the only one at the end of the semester that actually did it. You know, so anyway. So it's all about power and control, and I started to do that with my children, and I didn't want to become what I hated. I didn't want to become my parents. I didn't want to continue the cycle of abuse in my family. And so I did everything that I had to do. And as a result, you know, I you know, became a counselor. You know, I taught parenting classes. I went to the treatment, you know, drug and alcohol. I you know, became a parenting instructor and so I could learn everything that I needed to learn so that I wouldn't do the same thing to my children. But domestic violence is real. Um, don't be passive about it because it's a child. And stand up for them. You know, if they tell you that something happens, you know, you have to stand up for that child because they don't have anybody to fight for them. You know, even if they're lying, I'd rather be on the side of the child because nobody was there for me, nobody believed me. You know, and so I took the, my daughter's side when she told me that she had an incident with a family member. And I wasn't sure that I really entirely believed her, but I chose to stand by her anyways. You know, and uh, so anyway, I'm going to share a song with you called Freedom. And that's my new mantra. I'm playing the guitar with House and Lilies. <laughs>
want to welcome everyone back to the first annual Great Joseph Fair fundraiser brought to you by staff.org. You know, the first um, hour here we have Vivian Gale, the honorist You can learn more about her at VivianGale.com. Our next um, special guest speaker is Eric George. He's going to come and um, help us to understand what it's like to live through abuse as an abuser, but also to understand his process that he's going through to heal himself and those that was affected by the abuse. So I'd like to welcome Eric George. Um, facing, facing yourself, I think, is one of the hardest things to do in life. Looking at yourself in the mirror, knowing who you are, and uh, you know, just living a day-to-day -day life. Um, I don't think people will every day look in the mirror, tell themselves how beautiful they are, or what kind of person they are, and what they're going to be in their future. You need to do that. Um, you know, it's like every day when I get dressed. I gotta tell myself I look good when I step out the door, and I might have a good day, you know? Um, so, just to give you a breakdown about me, my name is Eric George, today's my birthday, I'm 32. Um, thank you for uh, my mom coming, my name is Jim, for bringing me in this world, and my best friend Tim, um, and for you guys giving me this opportunity to be here. Um, excuse me, I'm a little emotional right now. <sighs> person of how my mom has raised me and what she wanted out of me or expected out of me. Um, she did a beautiful job at raising me. We had our ups and our downs just like uh, any parent has with their child. I have children myself, six. Um, you know, so I really commend you for, for what you've done um, and you still being here for me for all the struggles that I've put you through. Um, we went through tough love and everything. And um, I was emancipated at the age of 16. And I blamed my parents for emancipating me. I don't feel like I was ready to uh, be emancipated or even felt like that I even knew how to even raise myself. Um, but I took that step and, you know, lived my life and, and uh, kept going and did what I had to do. Um, also, for the last 10 years, I've been in and out of jail. I just recently was incarcerated for uh, six months for a domestic violence situation um, because that has been my pattern in life. Um, the people that have always loved me the most, I've took my anger out on. Um, and so what I'm trying to do within myself is trying to find a better way on how to deal with my situations on an everyday basis and surround myself with better people than I used to. Because I feel like who you surround yourself with, sometimes you're just going to be like them. So uh, if, you're, if you surround yourself with good people, you know, you should, you should end up being a good person. So um, my phone's going crazy right now. Excuse me. Um, I'm just kind of lost in my mind right now. It's kind of overwhelming. So basically what I'm saying is uh, it's been a long journey and I'm happy to be here. I'm here for a reason and uh, I'm definitely supporting this because I need to stop uh, from the hurt that I put on of the women that have been in my life, that have been there for me um, and just make a difference, not just for me but for my kids because they look up to me as they're being their role model, their guidance and uh, knowing what type of person they should be in their life. Four boys and two girls, um, you know, it's a lot. I put myself in that situation, I'm gonna do the job to be the dad that I need to be. So, as me needing to be this role model that I need to be, I'm making that step to wanna make a difference. And today, 
I'm doing everything I can to stop and make that difference. So I support uh, stopping domestic violence all the way. And I'm going to stay on this journey with you guys and support you guys in any way that I can. So thank you. Um, that's just to give you guys, you know, uh, an insight about me and what's been going on with me and how I want to change. Um, yeah. So I put together a little poem and I'm going to read it to you guys. As I stand here staring myself down in the mirror, it shatters. Shatters from the shame of what I have done. Shatters from the disappointment from my loss of control. Shatters from the disgust of myself. Shatters from the hurt in your eyes. Shatters from the loss of your trust. Shatters from knowing things can never be the same. Shatters from the broken promise I made to myself to change. Shatters from the inability to look at myself in the eye. I've already told you my name. My name is Eric George. <laughs> I'm here acknowledging my actions in my past. I have hurt a lot of people that, and that cannot be taken back. I'm here because I want, because I want because I want to and need to change and break the cycle of, violence, of domestic violence. My actions have not only taken the innocence of my victims, but have taken a huge emotional toll on, my, on myself. Like a clown, I put on a, on a show masking my pain and misery. Violence not only hurts the victims, it hurts the perpetrator. The cycle of violence needs to come to an end. For that to happen, both the victim and the perpetrator need help. I would never minimize, I would never minimize the effects my actions take on anyone, but I am here to tell you that I hurt too. Not knowing how to handle this hurt has played a significant role in, my, in, in why I am here today. I am here to confess to everyone and, and acknowledge I need to make a change from within. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that. You know, it's it's not an easy task to to step up and actually own to something that you have done that might hurt others. But I do commend you, and I and I thank you very much for sharing your experience. And we, we wish to be with you along that that journey of healing. Our next speaker that we're going to bring to the stage is Haley Langston. She's going to do a poem from my book entitled Butterflies in, in a Heartache. <clears throat> and um, she is also the founder of an organization called Youthful Expressions. And her website is www.youthfulexpressions.com. She likes to talk about um, Everything from things that are bothering us in the world, from, from homelessness to even how she enjoys cupcakes. <laughs> and the book that she's reading from is Unrequited Love and, and Letting Go. And the title of the poem is Before the Healing. Here is like, here is Haley. Cupcake. Okay. But I always want to write about something about food or something about shapes. Because, and you can embrace it. Because if you love something, then you can make it a poem. Lots of people sometimes write poems about, well, there's an the example. Some people like lollipops. People can write a poem about lollipops or balloons. So here's a poem that my mom wrote that I think is really dead. Good morning, my heartache. I wait to see you laying next to me once again. You are reaching out and embrace me as we are friends. This is being, the sun is beaming through 
the window. It would be nice to enjoy, but you will only guide me to the shadows of my heart. So the dark I can see way out, I'll try to live the life of a blind woman. Your, your walls continue to close in me on in on me like a rat. Like a rat, I'm trapped, running in the never-ending circle. Because one day I realized that I felt like pain was an actual entity that would chase me down whenever I was trying to be happy, um, whenever I was trying to be successful, whenever I was trying to forget about my past. And so I thought that if I spoke to my pain, that I would be able to befriend her or him or it, and in that befriending. Um, stop being stalked by my pain. So this poem is uh, called Touches of Love. And it's on page 37. Clutches of Love. Oh pain, please release me from your relentless clutches of lunacy. Why have you come again to reclaim my mind, my body, and my soul? Oh pain, your big stalking stare is getting old. Fully fledged, you have no mercy. Go away from me. I can handle this all on my own. Who called for you besides? Sleep. Leave me to soak and soak in the valley of my tear-filled abode. Don't ever lay your hands on me again. Imprints from where you have clutched me in the past still mark my soul. Go, trample the feet of them that have stolen my revel for life. Trample on me no more. Stalk the paths of those that have deceived, manipulating themselves and me. You take more of me than I even own. I hate you more. Give me back my fake friends and their fake smiles. Make void their proclamations of I love you. And you know I always got your back, girl. Send them back their fictions. Give them rocks like Charlie Brown. Them and all their facelessness is easier to swallow than the brutal monogamies of you. Bring them back, please. Bring them back, please. Go away, away from me. I don't want what has been sown. You plant a seed that flowers, briars, and thorns. Impossible to bear. Have you come to laugh at my faith, hope, and juvenile trust? I situated in earthen vessels, not yet awakened to their own souls. You have stolen all the me I've known. I don't have the strength to gain me back again. So keep your ill-gotten gain in the dark and sullen clenches of your unpardoning abode and release me into the clutches, into the clutches of love. And so the actual writing of this poem was ours and it came with a lot of tears and <laughs> sobbing. But I, I think at the end of it, I was able to make my pain my friend. You know, and as I be able to begin to make her my friend, I was able to nurture her and nurture pain. And I wasn't afraid of it anymore, so I stopped running away from my pain. And I started addressing my pain. Um, and that's when I started becoming a whole person. So I'm going to sing a song for you that I wrote a few years ago. It's called, um, It's Okay. I'm singing this song for the young man who just spoke. What's his name? Eric. Eric. I'm singing this song dedicated to you. Thank you. And to anyone else in the audience that has been moved or touched by feelings that they didn't know. to go down on your knees and 
situation that it is their fault, that they somehow cause the individual to make them be the way that they are. As we have learned from Eric that you know there are other underlying issues that, that make that situation come to be. And that's what I want to that work to do. I want to be a foundation for everyone to heal from the abuser to the one that's being abused. But we have to come together as a whole to do that. And every nine seconds in the U.S., there's a woman that is abused. And domestic violence is a leading cause of injury to women. Even more than heart accidents, muggings, and rape. Studies suggest that up to 10 million children witness some form of domestic violence annually. Nearly one in five teenage girls who have been in a relationship said a boyfriend threatened violence or self-harm if presented with a breakup. Every day in the U.S., more than three women are murdered by their husbands or, or boyfriends. Ninety-two percent of women surveyed listed that reducing domestic violence and sexual assault as their top concern. Domestic violence victims lose nearly eight million days of paid work per year in the U.S. alone. That is equivalent of 32,000 full-time jobs. Based upon reports in 10 countries, between 55 and 95 percent of women who have been physically abused by their partners never contacted non-governmental agencies for assistance. The cost of intimate partner violence in the U.S. alone exceeds $5.8 billion per year. $4.1 billion are for direct medical and health care services, while productivity loses account nearly $1.8 billion in the workforce. And men who, as children, witness their parents' domestic violence were twice as likely to abuse their own wives of non-violent You know, many think that just by leaving a domestic violence situation means that that scar ceases to exist, that a person can just move on 
and leave their other past behind, but that's really not true. Um, because that they are torn down both physically and emotionally, it makes it difficult for them at times to live productive lives as well as meaningful relationships. I have a poem that I'm going to share. It's entitled, Immortalized. It will, it will highlight the fact that that abuse that was taking place can live long after the abuser is gone. Tears reach out to kiss my face through my soul and eyes. Cries no longer exist. Just white noise is heard ringing in my ears. It has been three years since I've spoken to my family. Three years since I worked and earned my own money. Three years since I've been outside these walls. Two years since he had a son, not mine, and I raised him in our home. One year since receiving medical treatment for that fall up his fist. One week and two days since I ran into the door and bruised both eyes. Never do I say that he is the one that lays his hands on me. Never would I expect him to be sorry for what he says he did not do. All these things done, I caused it and down to his infidelity. He could not make love to me because my body is covered with cigarette burns. And this is hideous to him. Was it really that he did not want to face himself sketched in my flesh? I am his canvas and he is the artist. My wrists wear permanent bracelets where the wire once laid, bounding my body to a chair, causing me to hold my bladder for hours on end until I could no longer. I am his handiwork, but this artist does not want to leave his signature on his masterpiece. Are my broken jaw and nose appealing to him? Does he not love the whelps that run down my back? It got to the point that he just would not look at me, period. If he did, his eyes grew with rage. His belly soured from his guilt. Years went by and I continued to wear his masterpiece on my canvas. Continued to raise his son whom he did not even know. Eyes no longer swollen, but those tears kissed my cheeks daily. And daily he would avoid me as though I was the plague. In reality, he was his own. Alcohol was his nourishment. Dreams of his abuse poorly haunted his dreams. And masked his reality so it would be all he could see. Eyes open or closed. I found him one day, morning after getting his son off to school. He drank himself to death. Most likely trying to calm the voices in his head changed the fact that he is the artist that created me. My pride no longer exists, but his existence has been mortalized in my scars. I wrote another piece that um, is kind of on the the lines of the um, abuser, but he's apologizing for his actions. And this piece is entitled Pieces of Time. Tick, tick, tick. I listen to the clock tick in my mind as I sit on my throne on my eight by 10 castle. A man's castle is his home and his home a sanctuary until I gained a, mor a mortgage at the state prison. Trapped away from the world, but not from my sins, nightly I could see your face, hear your screams, recall, recall your pleading cries. I didn't care that I took your childhood. My only concern was of my own satisfaction. Physical pleasure, tick, tick, tick. I tried to hold onto pieces of time because mine is running out. I want to ask for your forgiveness. I am sorry for the pain I caused. Stealing an emotion you would not be able to get back. 
the enjoyment of the first touch, first embrace, tick, tick, tick. Time is running out for me, struggling to capture some glimpse of hope with no light inside. I wish I could give you back those pieces of time. The next piece that I'm going to share with you is entitled Emotional Train Wreck. And the inspiration behind this piece is to, to share that even our children at, at a very young age is really impacted by the abuse. And it could take them to a level of hatred that no child should ever have to endure. I could recall. It was my mama's signature. Then sealing her unholy act with a kiss. Ever since daddy stopped being her king, not caring about her period. No good mornings, no I love yous. I became her fantasy. Bounding my breasts wear a short fro. No dresses, no dolls to play with. I was transformed into her little man. Christine dies and Kevin was born. Hush, little baby. Don't say a word. Sealing her unholy acts with a kiss. Childhood dreams become a distant memory. Other girls played house, dreamed of their prince, being a mother and wife. My dream, a horror made into reality. My reality, her death. I was only 13 and already was doing a life in prison. Trading this life for an 8 by 10 sounds like freedom. And I wanted freedom. Hush, little baby. Don't say a word. Before she could still look at the kiss, she felt a sharp pain in her throat. The switchblade she bought me to, to protect me from the men in the world stuck out into her neck. Blood oozed and covered the engraving. Mama loved her little girl. I recall when the handcuffs were placed on my wrist. The officer asked, was it worth your freedom? Probably I said, her last breath was my freedom. I felt like I was an emancipated slave. The next poem that I'm going to share is entitled 16 Candles. My sweet 16 was supposed to be like a fairy tale. Our friends and I dressed in gowns and tucks, celebrating life, dancing till dawn. Pictures galore, sweet palms, ancient nerves, wondering if we would be kissed under the mistletoe. Instead, my 16 candles were four stitches to my face, one puncture to my lungs. Relying upon a breathing apparatus, my left leg is broken in three places. I have to use a catheter and deem incontinent. My stepfather angry that I had a boyfriend, angry that I will not let him touch me. Two knives wounds to my torso, one black eye, three broken fingers, one dead boyfriend. You see, when Patrick arrived to pick me up, my stepfather was waiting on the porch with a shotgun. Patrick never made it to the porch. My stepfather and I fought. He figured now he would get what he wanted. I was not going to allow him to take my innocence. My virginity was not his to decide when I was to lose it. Swiss, sweet 16 was bittersweet. I cannot blow out my candles. I have to wait for my 16 candles to fill. Our 
children are precious gifts from God, and with this in mind, we want to do all that we can to protect them from harm. It is our job to ensure our children that we know what the dangers are and the signs that danger is near. We need to pull together and be an umbrella over our children. Child abuse is more than bruises and broken bones. While physical abuse might be the most visible sign, other types of abuse, such as emotional abuse, child neglect, also leave deep, long lasting scars. Some signs of child abuse are subtler than others. However, by learning common, by learning what you can do about the abuse, you can make a huge effect in your child's life. The earlier abuse children get, the real chance they have to heal from from the abuse and, and not perpetuate the cycle. Learn the signs and symptoms of child abuse and break the cycle by finding out where to get help in children and their caregivers. Learn the signs and symptoms of child abuse and help break the cycle. And we can assist you with that at www.stopabusepeace.org. <coughs> Another factor of abuse that many choose not to, um, to face that actually exists is the abuse of men. You know, women are said to be the weaker vessels and that men are stronger, so how can a woman abuse a man freely? But daily, there are men that suffer from abuse silently. It can go from Emotional abuse done by verbally um, out, outraged wars between the men and women, even down to physical. <clears throat> I wrote a poem entitled Emotional Train Wreck to, to um, showcase what exactly a man tends to go through with abuse. Her words, her words ran through me like a runaway train crashing into the mountainside. All aboard, tickets please. This is a non-refundable one-way ticket to emotional destitute. Please notice there are no emergency exits, no seat belts, no first aid to banish wounds, and yes, you may have a fucked up day. Thank you for traveling with Vicious RS train. The conductor stood 5'3", 140 pounds, 36, 24, 28. Smile sweet as candy. Oh, how he loved her, and then she began to articulate thought. That sounds bad, but at first it was stimulating conversation until he uttered the words, I love you, let's get married. In the vows, it should have said, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife in sickness and in health and in her bitchiness until you commit emotional suicide? You never think of a man being the emotionally weaker, fragile to the point of no return. It started with a seemingly innocent new jokes, he he ha ha, in front of her friends, all laughs until her words turned into train wrecks. You are never going to be the man that I need. She would say, faithfully, at breakfast, two years, five days, 13 hours, and 20 minutes we have been there. I could always depend upon my morning travels to I Can Do Betterville, followed by a layover at 30 seconds, I should never get back. I really never thought much of it. She seemed depressed and I knew that she was she had a sorrowful past. Being her emotional punchy bag didn't seem harmful. When asked by friends, does this happen often? I felt compelled to, to protect her, create excuses for her demeanor, even I did not believe them. She is my wife, and I am her husband. I truly believe that this was temporary and it would soon pass, just as the sands in our glass that time for this treatment would work out. Truthfully, I felt I was okay. No bruises to be seen, no scars to hide. 
I would keep telling myself that I know she loves me. Then she ed educated me according to her knowledge. If you don't speak up for yourself, I would not put you through these things. I have been testing you and you have failed, she says. Proceeding to let me know that if I was a man, I would not allow her to speak ill of me. I would work four or five jobs to make sure she is happy and wanting nothing. Funny that never, she never mentioned her needs for she knew those were always met. If I was a man, I would lay down my hands and set her straight, she says. Can you imagine that? If I do speak up, she says, I'm not respecting her. Her lies are immortalized as truth within her mind, forgetting that I was the one that loved her. But she says, I never loved you, just wanted to be a kept woman. It was at that point I realized that, yes, I had no physical wounds. Emotionally, I was a wreck, bound up inside as though I collided with the wall of rock. My train ride was not over yet. You see, I had only begun this journey. I still had my pit stop in. Who would, what, who would want your broke ass? You are more worthless than a man, a maimed horse. These emotional bruises I incurred hurt deeper than a blade in, the, in my back. Scarring so deep that no bandages could ever heal or cover it. All aboard, the conductor yells out every morning. Until one morning she finds her train has no passengers. She is left at the train depot holding her anger in one hand and misery in the other. What hearing her distorted thoughts fry her brain. She begins her train ride solo. Her final destination, loneliness and despair, with no light in sight. I wish I could give you back those. I, <clears throat> another reason that I also had started Stop.org is because I went through a domestic violence situation while I was married to my first husband. And just as we learned from Vivian earlier in the um, event that, you know, sometimes we can live under these um, conditions and not realize exactly that we are being abused. Fortunately for me, I was not on the end of the physical receiving, but still that emotional abuse was deep cutting, just the same. You know, a little bit after I had my daughter, I had already was feeling a little down about myself because I had gained weight. I, I wasn't feeling very, um, I didn't feel much like a woman, really. I just felt like a blob that, that existed. And of course, you know, there was a postpartum depression that most of us women go through. And unfortunately for me, mine went a whole lot longer than just those first few months. And we get to the point to where we we would justify our spouse or our boyfriend's actions because we really do feel that if we would have done something different, that they would not have done or said some of the things that they do. But in reality, that's really not true. You know, we can do everything they expect you to do, but the moment that something in their life does not go right, um, they have a rough day at work, their car breaks down, it always, they always say that it's easier for someone to take it out on their loved ones who are closer to expect that person to forgive them versus doing so with someone that they don't even know. Staff at work, we strive really to, to educate and to uplift, and we want to do so by bringing in the community and to also um, give a home for those who are in need of, of healing. With that in mind, we will be having workshops all throughout the year, starting in January. The first workshop that, well, the first of many is entitled Lion's Heart. And this is a um, prevention training program, as well as a healing one, to assist men who have dealt with emotional abuse, but as well as to give a foundation for those who were on the end of the abuser. 
we want to help them to understand that you can't always make a change in, in your life. For some, that change might, may need to a new job. Maybe they need to uplift their spirits that way. Maybe they need to go through education. And through this, um, through this one program as well, we will provide employment training, scholarships for school, and referrals to, to mental health organizations for counseling. The next one is Wisdom's Heart. And this will touch the basis of elderly abuse, which you know, it's really rapid throughout um, the country, especially in the nursing homes and a lot of times in um, private homes. Wisdom Heart pumps life into our elderly community by teaching the signs of abuse, how to pre prevent, where each of us can seek help and guidance in an abusive situation. This workshop is designed for families, health organizations, and the general public. And the next one is Stops Halo, which this one is designed for the children. We know that it takes a village to raise a child and a nation to raise a village. We should provide them with resources and education to know how to protect themselves, to know the signs of possible abuse. But we will also help provide scholarships for medical, mental health, and counseling. And, and the last one is Woman's Love. And this workshop is designed to give women their strength and the ability to heal. A, a strength of a woman is her love. And however, after living through an abusive situation, this strength is demolished as if the abuse itself was kryptonite to the woman. Our Women's Love Program is designed to assist women to get back to self-love. Learn how to love oneself after weathering the storm of and abuse. This renewal of self-love will give each woman the ability to face the challenge of living and enjoying life. Stephanie Earth strives to be the foundation which these women can grow and love oneself for each of beautiful butterflies waiting to spread their wings. Staff.org will offer regular workshops and seminars to assist women, men in this task, along with employment and educational seminars. The employer seminars can consist of resume building, mock interviews. The education portion will consist of classes which are which individuals can attend to obtain a new skill or certificate of completion. There will also be scholarship offered to allow individuals to obtain schooling and refresher courses. I would like to thank everyone for taking up their time and being here with us as we have um, celebrated our first annual red dress affair. I would like to close it with a poem that it was written by Rose Marie Wilson and it's entitled Courageous Goodbye. Can't view you as a man to be held in high esteem. You are vulgar, immoral, selfish, and mean. The kinds of words I've formerly heard you say very seldom now have ever come my way. Fingers with which I locked when we recited or vows, or connected to the hands I presently disavow. The hands I held while walking through the streets became weapons of destruction knocking me off my feet. The charming voice I heard conveying the words, I love you, replaying profanity while my skin is beat black and blue. You repeatedly apologized, saying you never strike me again. Those words promptly changed after you drank five o'clock gin. When I asked you why you treat me the way you do, you replied, baby is me, has nothing to do with you. I worked to raise our children, I cooked and I cleaned. Made sure your needs were fulfilled and our home stayed, stayed serene. The special things I do for you were never quite enough. I loved you as your woman. You made being your wife tough. 
I was here with you when we had no wealth. Stood by your side in sickness and in health. I did what I could and endured all I can before reality set in and I realized you're not a real man. My mind, heart, and eyes are no longer saw the man I knew. For you were just a shell of a man you had no clue. What an example you set for the children for the children we're, mis we're raising. I'm being sarcastic, darling, not singing your praises. A real man would never hit a woman, that cowardly affair. I felt enough toxic taps and suffered more than I could bear. We've gone through counseling, even met with our priest. Neither session worked, so I must find my own relief. I love you, darling, with my entire mind, heart, and soul. I need to live a good life for before my body goes cold. I'm a fool to leave you in a bigger fool if I stay. I'm blessed, I'm a blessed fool as you can't or just won't walk away. Living life itself can be a difficult task without the added stress of a man who wears a mask. A man whose loving, a man whose love song is sung via his fists. The man who's un un unafraid of compelling jail risks. I rid myself of your wicked ways and pray that the future brings our kids and not better days. And again, this was a poem written by Rose Marie Wilson. And you can learn more about her at www.onesinglerose.com. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here. And you can reach out to us at staff.org, at stoptheabusepeace.org, at gmail.com, or our website, www.stoptheabusepeace.org.